welcome Professor Rona. And um, uh, my uh, partner for this dialogue today is uh, one of the most uh, complex uh, thinkers of our time. And um, uh, uh, we know about uh, Professor Rona that he his main uh, 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 research these days the political foundations of economy. And I would like to start with an anecdote, which uh, uh, a lot of people know. I, I just really like it. Uh, is that about the, uh, the, te the the theoretical economist and the shepherd? Uh, well, I don't know whether you know it that uh, the theoretical economist walking the fields and uh, meet this uh, shepherd and his hordes of sheep, and uh, the theoretical e economist asks the um, ask the uh, the shepherd if I can estimate the number of your sheep, will you give me one? And the shepherd said, well, okay. And then he applies his method of calculation and he says uh, 326 sheep. And um, the, uh, the shepherd admits, yes, yeah, you, 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 you correct. And then uh, the theoretical economist happily uh, picks up a, a, a cute black sheep and uh, and then leaving the shepherds, shepherd asks him, um, are you a theoretical economist? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the economist surprised says, yes, uh, how do you know? And the shepherd answers, um, if you drop my dog, I will tell you. <laughs> so, uh, Sometimes uh, I wanted to tell this, this story or, or apply, uh, you know, uh, the famous Woody Allen thing that if you don't know how to, uh, to do it, you, uh, you teach it. Teach it. If you don't even know how to teach, you are the football coach or the gym teacher. But uh, 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 my, my guest today is, is a, a complete uh, 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 opposite because... Uh, uh, Professor Rona is one of those who, who um, not only stayed in the um, in the ivory tower of academia, but from very early um, uh, uh, in his career, he uh, had ha held posts uh, both in in uh, very important. Uh, uh, private financial institutions um, in North America and, and Europe, and also worked for uh, uh, for central ba banks, among others, the Bank of England, uh, uh, the IMF, the Hungarian Central Bank, uh, etc. And and please uh, correct me uh, if I am wrong. And um, and also uh, 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 very multidisciplinary background after graduating from. Uh, one of the best uh, Ivy League uh, schools uh, of economics uh, in in, uh, in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, I remember uh, you you uh, uh, studied with with, with uh, Lawrence Klein and others. Then you uh, obtained a low degree in Oxford, and um, and uh, uh, today you your views of uh, about the foundations of economics are are. Um, I, I, I widely um, um, sought after, and uh, also uh, what I, I, I have to uh, uh, have to uh, mention here that besides all these things, you are an award-winning uh, uh, artisan cheesemaker and also uh, an acclaimed painter with uh, a recent exhibition in a gallery in in Budapest. In your um, recent interview or a panel which which i i, I heard um you mentioned that uh, uh that, that we need we need a new word order uh which which has to be the scale and and i think you refer the 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 famous uh, uh paradigm change uh, theory of thomas kuhn 
that it, it has to be of that scale and that important. Uh, otherwise, we, we are doomed to uh, even the darker times. And the first question, if we, if we um, uh, need this, this paradigm change, uh, what can that be? And without answering the question, question myself, uh, is, can this paradigm change anything else than, uh, uh, than a, a, a real seriously taken paradigm of sustainability? All right, maybe I didn't explain myself as clearly as I should have in that interview. But I think that the paradigmatic change that I'm talking about is not a voluntary matter. It's not a question of what we need or what we would like or what we intend. Uh, let me step back and a few fundamental issues, uh, clarify a few fundamental points. Um, beginning with the second part of the uh, 18th century, historic um, historical writing, historical analysis, uh, turned to a notion of history to the effect that it is a continuous flow and a progression towards ever better conditions, ever greater uh, development, and so on and so forth. Indeed, ultimately, history fulfills itself. This is Hegel and others in the 19th century. And in the 20th century, as he famously described, Francis Fukuyama postulated the fulfillment and the end of history. So there is this idea of history flowing and progressing towards a teleological end of perfection. A lot of struggles, things, but things are moving forward in a progressive sense. <clears throat> I do not subscribe to that theory of history. The alternative theory, or at least one major alternative theory to that, is that history comes in paradigmatic pieces, in chunks, in segments, and that between these segments, there are there is uh, the segments represent abrupt radical changes. So um, the, the Renaissance ended not because people thought that they needed a new paradigm, but because a new paradigm evolved rather rapidly. Um, modernism ended not because people thought that we need a new paradigm is, is ending, not because people uh, think that we need a new paradigm, but because it has exhausted itself and there is a search for a new paradigm. Um, the paradigm, these paradigmatic changes were fully explored by Michel Foucault, the French philosopher, in his famous Les Mots et les Choses uh, book, um, where what he's talking about is a domain of concepts that characterizes a paradigm. And the domain of concepts that, paradise, that characterizes the paradigm we are leaving is the liberal uh, worldview uh, and the liberal values associated with that worldview. That worldview is clearly in very, very serious trouble. And I am maintaining, I'm claiming that it is, it is about to end. Now, the unfortunate thing is that the shifts in paradigms usually involve a great deal of chaos, suffering, confusion, even war and violence uh, until a new one emerges. And oftentimes the emergence of the new one is started with rather unpleasant dictatorial uh, means. So the French Revolution concluded the paradigm of classicism, the classical period uh, of rationalist philosophy. It ended in horrible, in a horrible way, in a bloodbath uh, and total chaos uh, in, in France and in much of Europe. Um, it was followed by a dictator, Napoleon. Uh, but out of Napoleon's uh, relatively short 
presence emerged a new order. Okay. Uh, that new order may be described as a liberal or if you like neoliberal order to, to include the current situation. And that is simply coming to an end. Uh, whether we like it or not, it's not a question of needing a new paradigm. It's a question that there is going to be a new paradigm, but before there is a new paradigm, there's going to be a lot of chaos and a fair amount of suffering. So that's my basic, uh, uh, basic thesis. Now, you know, we can speculate on what that new paradigm might look like, uh, but that is, that is speculation. That is a very, very difficult thing to, to, to describe. However, if I use Foucault's uh, approach, I can point to a few rather important key issues. The first one is that under the current paradigm, uh, there is regardless of whether one is on the left or on the right of the, of the intellectual spectrum, there is a belief in the unicity of reality. So, for example, your friend uh, Erwin Laszlo uh, uh, you know, writes a book about a general theory of everything. Uh, and the idea is that all reality can be systematized into a coherent, logically integrated system. Um, I think that notion is dead or dying. Uh, the new emerging notion is that there is no unity, and I subscribe to that. I'm one of the proponents of that uh, new notion that uh, reality is not unified. Uh, there is no unicity, that reality is particular, and much of reality comes about, much, much of events and realities come about through the clash of particulars that would not take place if, in fact, there was such a thing as a unicity of reality. Insofar as our current, our present conversation is concerned, this is most relevant in the case of the social sciences, and I teach and research the methodology of the social sciences, um, that uh, claims, I claim, that the idea that the social sciences can somehow be derived from or made consistent with the principles of the natural sciences is a false one. That causation, which is a fundamental point of, of all scientific theories in the natural sciences, is entirely different from the nature of causation in social reality. So any devices or means that import causation from the natural sciences, primarily through mathematics, into the social sciences is mistaken. It creates a false reality, creates a false illusion, and it doesn't work. Why not? Because causation in the natural sciences is a matter of the property or properties of the objects uh, at play. Uh, water comes about because the valence, or minus two valence, of an oxygen uh, atom combines with the valence of a hydrogen atom. And that, that valence is a property of oxygen and of hydrogen, and it is that valence that makes the combination possible. So the causation is the result of the valences, that is to say the properties of the objects. And that is true throughout uh, biology, uh, physics, chemistry, and so forth. So, so, so it's, 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 it, that, that, that's how it is. Uh, conductivity in physics, uh, you, know, you can multiply the examples, all rela relate to the property of copper versus aluminum versus um, uh, steel. Uh, versus wood, which, you know, so it, 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 it's a property of the object that, that we are talking about. Net, uh, social phenomena have no such properties. They may have tendencies, they may have probabilistic uh, features, statistical probabilistic features, 
but they are not properties. Um, so an understanding of social reality through a causation theory borrowed from the natural sciences is, is mistaken. And that is the, that notion, that causal uh, idea has dominated the social sciences throughout the 20th century and most particularly post-World War II, where it do totally dominated positivist school, uh, totally dominated the economic theory and sociology and psychology uh, as well. Uh, that, that won't do anymore. And in fact, if you look at and if you look at uh, this kind of stuff that the current world of research is concerned with in, in economics and sociology and so on and so forth, these research papers are highly particular, and they don't they don't try to insert their uh, findings or their models into any kind of a general theory. They say, well, you know, language acquisition at, at age two works as follows, based on an experiment that I conducted with 200 two-year-olds. Okay, and then, and then he explains how he conducted the experiment, what was involved, and what he found, and, and so on and so forth. So, so, you know, he's not, that, that researcher is not interested in justifying or even contradicting any kind of a gen law like generalization that may be present in his field of science. He is interested in a particular phenomenon or at the most a particular set of phenomena and tries to explore and understand that phenomena. Uh, so we are abandoning the universalization tendencies which I, I, I thought, I, I rather think that that universalizing tendency was a parallel of 19th and 20th century political imperialism. It was a form of intellectual imperialism, just as we can do dominate the whole world, we can dominate and understand all of reality. And that is now out. Uh, the second, and, and uh, to, together with that, uh, reductionism, that is to say, the, the you know, boiling down reality, as the saying goes, to its essential features is also out. Reality does not come, the particulars of reality, reality does not come labeled uh, essential and non-essential. The very idea that something is essential and not, something else is not essential, whereas economists would have it, something is exogenous and something else is endogenous, is, is um, a discredited idea because there is no way other than through the postulation of, a, of an a priori theory to distinguish between what is exogenous and what is endogenous, what is the essence of something and what is not the essence of something and so on and so forth. So that's, Thank that's you. What now, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, I, I just wanted to um, to um, um, add that, um, you know, your view very clearly art articulates, uh, which we already talked about a few times, that this uh, theory driven understanding of the of the word is 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 especially uh, this uh, uh, age of the engineer. Uh, type view that uh, uh, with a, with a um, uh, natural science theory you can understand uh, uh, social processes. Uh, this is very clearly articulated um, in, in, in what you said and, and uh, really resembles uh, uh, to the anecdote I started with that's good to know which one is the ship, which one is the, uh, the, the dog is not enough to have the uh, uh, have the, uh, uh, the the theory and uh, um, uh, you know this this is now uh, in the air. Richard Sennett, the famous sociologist and political scientist, calls it the ruling incoherence. Uh, right. That's that that's his his his, his term. Uh, my uh, late teacher Emmanuel Wallerstein, um, you know. Uh, uh, just before he he died, he 
you know, he was a Marxist. And uh, with this, as you described, both the liberals and the uh, and the left are in 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 problem because with the simple schemes schemes even George Stiglitz said that uh, simple schemes to understand uh, uh, the the present reality is not enough. It's not enough to uh, to uh, study class struggle or uh, uh, you know the homo economicus that private interest and and market will uh, take care of everything. We know now there is no. Uh, perfect equilibrium. We know there is no perfect competition. There, we know that a lot of things cannot be uh, uh, cannot be uh, left to the uh, uh, to the market. Uh, and and we are in 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 a in an area uh, that um, uh, these these uh, uh, ideas. Uh, the way we look at the word really have to be revised. But at the same time, and uh, of course, uh, one of the occasions that we're talking uh, like this, not in your uh, in, in your beautiful estate, which I had the privilege to uh, uh, to visit, but through uh, electronic devices, is this uh, uh, what I would call that nature is calling. You know, is is uh, you you don't have. Uh, uh, that that much time and and uh, now I'm a little bit turning to you as a, 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 as your economic. I know it's not separable, but but e- economists had that you know we, we still and this was um, just before he died. Wallenstein last complained that we just not able to give up the idea of. Uh, uh, this uh, 19th century development that you know if everybody follows private interest it will be uh, will lead to development and will be better that will be better for uh, for everything but somehow this this idea of development was based on an idea and an ever available and increasing availability of natural resources, of uh, of uh, uh, using uh, uh, cheap labor wherever. Yeah, of course, uh, Emmanuel was very concerned about the uh, you know capital moving to the to the cheapest parts of the uh, world where the, the the least regulations are. Um, but now we we very brutally facing um, that a lot of Things are not just unlimited, but we are running out of uh, 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 things and the, the patience of, of our, our uh, natural world. And also, uh, it seems that it's, 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 it's inevitable that in the whole, whole uh, uh, consumer structure and, and the whole uh, economic machinery and operation, we really have to revaluate things. We have to revaluate natural resources. We have to revaluate human labor, which means that things should not be so readily available and so cheap prices as they are today. A lot of people uh, say that uh, business won't be as usual after this uh, uh, this crisis, even if there is a bounce back uh, effect of uh, holding back, and and in, it bounces back that that uh, one of the um, one of the, uh, uh, the 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 effect or or the 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 new circumstantial theater will be that that um, uh, we have to finally face uh, uh, time that that. Uh, uh, development is not not everything. It doesn't bring uh, human life quality ahead, and and uh, uh, run, pushing all of us uh, on the on, on the brink. And and uh, and I, I would like to uh, to ask some of your your thoughts on that. That that uh, do we need to. Um, to re- revalue from consumer to uh, to production to uh, 
to uh, the whole attitude toward towards the uh, natural natural world, which inevitably at the end of the day will be that you you will have less to consume at a higher price. Well, I think um, uh, there are two. I mean, there is a growing recognition that our way of life is not sustainable and that the globe is going to be, is now already in very, very serious trouble. Um, if there is no change in our way of life, um, uh, we are going to, in effect, self-destruct. Um, now, while there is that growing realization, um, by and large, most of the proposals having to do with that issue revolve around the juxtaposition of uh, some form of small state free market theory on the one hand and a powerful state with a lot of regulations and control uh, on the other. That juxtaposition, I think, needs to be and is indeed going to be is in the process of being replaced by another juxtaposition, a more important one, which is man against nature on the one hand and man with with nature on the other. So that the the new conception of how we ought to live is that we ought to live in harmony with nature. And that really it is our a better understanding of what it takes to be in harmony with nature that will regulate much of our behavior, including our consumption. Um, that in turn, of course, implies that the prevailing mainstream economic model uh, has to be abandoned in totality. And this is the issue. Uh, I think uh, Greta Thunberg's efforts in that respect have not been fully understood because she's not saying that you need to regulate uh, the oil giants in order to save the environment. She's saying the hell with the oil giants, let's stop consuming oil. Exactly, yeah. So, so that's a difference, that's a huge difference. Um, and, and obviously that mainstream economic theory saw progress and development uh, through, uh, achieved by means of stimulating uh, consumption. Growth was and remains to be under mainstream economic theory a function of consumption. The more that people consume, the more there is economic growth. So the question is, how do you make people to consume more? Uh, now, the answer to that question has become increasingly difficult. And as it has become increasingly difficult, uh, countries have more and more resorted to uh, piling up debt to stimulate consumption. Uh, I think that you know a lot of people are, for example, mesmerized by the spectacular growth of China. But in fact, that growth in China has been two and a half times as fast as economic growth. And today, China has a greater amount of accumulated debt than the United States. So, and, and you know, one can go on, and since 2008, there has been a spectacular explosive growth in debt throughout the world and particularly <clears throat> in the developed world. The way to get us out of the 2008 crisis was to, to generate a lot of debt with which consumption could be stimulated and through the stimulation of consumption, economic growth could be re recovered. We are doing exactly the same thing in the age of the coronavirus. The answer to the coronavirus is uh, generate a lot of debt, okay? Now, uh, can this debt be repaid? What will happen to this debt? And what happens 
if it turns out that it cannot be repaid, or or put it differently, it turns out that there is no way to finance this additional amount, this growing amount of debt. Uh, since 2008, thanks to Mario Draghi, the world resorted to the other possible way of stimulating consumption, which is to print money, uh, politely called quantitative easing. Quantitative easing. Uh, <laughs> uh, so let's increase that and let's increase the money supply. Let's print money is the way to get the economy back. Clearly, these measures have uh, limits at some point. Now, we can en enter into a very highly technical uh, discussion about where that limit might be, but that's not the subject of this conversation. But the notion that it is unlimited ability to generate debt and through debt finance uh, maintain economic growth is, 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 is unrealistic. It's a silly notion. It's, it's not going to work. And the same thing for quantitative easing. Therefore, therefore, there is nothing else that we can do but to reduce consumption and not necessarily by making consumption more expensive, although that would be a standard economic uh, remedy through the price mechanism and the market mechanism, but rather simply through a revision of what we think about life and what we think about nature. Uh, and I think you're seeing strong signs of that happening. People are consuming less and less. Uh, and, and I think that one of the consequences of the coronavirus crisis is that that reduced level of consumption will become a significant trend. They are not going to you know, jump on the, on the airplane and fly around the world for a four-day holiday. People are just not going to be doing that anymore. They're not going to go on these idiotic 15 floor high cruise ships to, to swim around in the, in the ocean, aim, you know, for, 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 for weeks, uh, because it's, it's just not, doesn't feel right anymore uh, after Richard Attenborough's uh, films of what we are doing to the ocean. It doesn't feel right. So, so, so the patterns of consumption will reduce they will change. Uh, the role of material consumption, the consumption of materials um, will diminish, uh, will be replaced, if you like, by the consumption of experiences. So, so be, be, people will, will consume intangibles, you know, great concerts, great this, that, that, that the other. Um, uh, because and and they they will try to I think I'm I'm optimistic in the sense that humanity is capable of this. They will try to revise, reinvent their relation to 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 nature and be much much more respectful towards nature than we have been hitherto. Um, um, unfortunately, um, uh, what what you say is not really uh, can be detected in the um, uh, the damage control policies of the of the uh, European Union, the US, uh, Trump advisors and their opponents. They all say, you know, stimulus, stimulus, stimulus now, debt, 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 and let's worry about that debt later. The other day I just heard uh, Obama's main, I, I can't recall his name now, uh, uh, economic advisor who's at Goldman Sachs now, he also said, you know, stimulus, 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 uh, don't worry about in, in, in that thing. Uh, and even George Soros with his perpetual bond or even right. gave a name console to, uh, to uh, uh, and, and the, uh, it seems that the aim is exactly what you say not to do to get yeah. back to get back where we were because yeah. all the stimuluses are to well, uh, to to get back uh, where we were and uh, you know whether you like Greta Thunberg or not uh, what she's saying and a lot of people 
feel that we shouldn't get back right where we were. That, that was a crazy, uh, crazy situation that we we don't have to uh, to uh, to uh, do uh, do a lot of things and and um, somehow I feel that. Uh, the governments eh, are missing the opportunity because people, I think m- now they're much more prepared and exercised actually during this crisis period or lockdowns to, to uh, reduce their, uh, yes. their sometimes artificially uh, generated desires. And all, oh, oh, wow, I could live without them. I could go bicycle. Instead of you know going in an all-inclusive uh, hotel resort, I can bicycle with my kids. Uh, you know I can do a lot of lot of a lot of other other things. But the the stimuluses or stimuli they all miss this. They really want everything get back to um to uh, where we were. And then as I see and I want to see your opinion that this um. Uh, of of course, I I I I'm a I'm a Hayek fan, but um, you know this uh, uh, state saving us is just increasing state dependency and nicely playing into the hands of those who enjoy being the the big brother giving the handouts, the uh, you know the dictators or wannabe dictators like. Uh, um, uh, our Orban and others who who enjoy this situation that that they they get this omnipotent and everything uh, uh, depends on them and they are the one who can who, who can reconstruct and 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 somehow uh, in very few places I see that they that they understand this this great opportunity. Because, no, they don't. Because, they... because, 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 because I uh, just wrong. I think this two months or three months put things that the most difficult ch- thing to change what's in your head, and this three months changed a lot of things in people's head, which with years of education couldn't couldn't reach it. And this is where where we should take off from and and. And do what you say, not just uh, aiming uh, the stimuli to uh, to uh, to uh, get back where we were. Right. Well, I think that you're entirely right in saying that governments uh, mm-hmm. throughout the world uh, are anxious to get back to where we were. They think that their responsibility is to get us back to where we were before Corona. Um, however. Uh, as much as they would like to do that, at the same time, the fact of the matter is that during Corona and well before Corona, governments have lost a great deal of prestige, credibility and authority. People don't trust governments anymore. And, and they haven't been trusting governments for quite a while now. And why not? And this is, this is part of the theory that I explained in the very beginning is that there is a paradigmatic change coming. They see, they sense that governments who were built on the on a, some kind of liberal or social liberal uh, paradigm are unable to deal with the realities that we have to deal with. Okay? Doesn't work. They're just not able to do it. And because they are not able to do it, people are turning away from governments and they are looking to carve out a life that's a livable life for themselves and their families. And as you say, they go bicycling because they say, well, you know, it's a nice thing to do with my kids, go bicycling, and I enjoy that, and that's fine. So I think that, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, Prominent fashion designers have a phenomenal ability to foretell what's coming. I mean, that's their business. It, their, their business is to invent the next thing, and they invent the next thing because they sense a public mood change in terms of what they would like people, what people would like to wear. 
And one after the other, starting with Giorgio Armani, have announced that the idea of sort of disposable clothing that you, you know, something that you buy and you wear it a few times and then you throw it away is over. He's, he's not doing that anymore. He's not even doing uh, seasonal collections, you know, spring, autumn, winter collection. No, he's making clothes, period. And his idea is to make clothes that can be repaired, uh, altered, tailored, if you get a bit, uh, you know, gain some weight, you don't have to throw it out and buy another piece of clothing because the way it has been cut is that there is no way to enlarge your jacket, right? Well, they'll, they'll cut it the way that you can take it to a tailor and he can make it a little bit bigger for you, right? And, and you know, he, he published a very interesting piece in the Italian press. I don't know how much it was picked up outside of Italy, uh, where he explained that that's the way it's going to be. He's going to make very good, very durable uh, clothing that can be used and worn again and again and again. Now, you know, if a Giorgio Armani is repositioning his business model on this basis, then I think you can conclude that there's something significant going on in the culture of our society, because he was and is a major force in, in the formation of consumer taste. So I think, you know, all told, in that sense, I am fairly optimistic, because I do think that there is this change. What I am worried about is that because of the incompetence of the ruling classes or the political elite, um, the old, this will result in a huge crash. So that they will pile on the debt, they will pile on the liquidity, and the market will crash. And when the market crashes, there will be civil violence, there will be chaos and disorder, much like with the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution. Uh, that, that the world will tumble into an absolute chaos. Uh, uh, you know, it can easily develop a major conflict between the United States and China. Uh, that, that can happen. Uh, there can be significant war in the world. There are wars going on all the time. There are horrible tensions in the world, in the regional tensions and international tensions. Uh, so it's, it's possible that this whole thing is just going to get out of hand and create a horrendous, chaotic situation instead of a, a, a more or less managed transition. Um, unfortunately, the historic record of paradigmatic change tends to favor the chaotic. There, is more, there are more examples of a chaotic transition than there are of a more you know, peaceful, smoother transition. Uh, we had two horrendous, chaotic uh, situations, the First World War and the Second World War. And between the two, we had a horrible, horrible the Holocaust and, 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 and all that that entailed, a horrible uh, 30 years uh, that uh, resulted in immense suffering until that you know, resolved itself through war. Uh, I just hope it's not, not that course that we will take, but I think there is a risk of that, a serious risk of that. Nevertheless, I do think that the old uh, liberal democratic paradigm uh, is exhausted itself. Now, one last point on this. Well, why has it exhausted itself? What's wrong with it? And most people, particularly on the liberal side, think it's because of the arrival of, of, of horrible characters like Viktor Orban or Vladimir Putin or, or, or Erdogan or, or, or whoever. No, no. It is because the liberal paradigm cannot solve the problems as they emerge 
And the reason it cannot solve the problems as they emerge is that it is built on the, 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 the uh, fostering of social consensus. In order to solve some kind of a problem, uh, liberal democracies uh, try to form a social consensus for a solution. Okay? It's the essence of liberal democracy. We don't impose our political will, say the leaders. We generate social consensus through the institutions that liberal democracies uh, entail. Uh, and the checks and balances, debate, freedom of the press, so on and so forth, that allows for the emergence of a consensus. The difficulty is that the rate of scientific and technological change is so fast that there is no time for social consensus. It's simply not possible to form social consensus. Uh, you can't form uh, social consensus around artificial intelligence and its introduction. It's happening. You're not going to, the uh, manufacturers and the scientists who make in, in, uh, artificial intelligence are not going to wait for public opinion to settle down on how artificial intelligence should be regulated. No, they're doing it. So, so liberal democracies don't no longer have the time and place for the formation of social consensus. And without social consensus, they don't have the means with which to resolve these problems. And that is the most fundamental claim to legitimacy of people like Orban, who can say to the opposition and to liberals, look, you couldn't do it. You can't get it done. I can get it done because I'm a tough guy. I'm very smart and I know the solution. I know the solution to the migration crisis. I don't care what people say. The solution is you build... Uh, uh, you know, control, you build a wall or you build whatever uh, at the border. And th that's it. Unfor unfortunately, this uh, self-claimed strongman usually rise after a crisis like yes. a mushroom in the uh, forest after rain. I have one more, one more question uh, which I have to ask. And um, uh, it was one of our telephone uh, conversation and, and your... Uh, words really uh, resonated uh, the, f f for a, for a long time. You said that you know the the in the new world order, which is emerging here, um, you have to expect. I don't remember how you put it, but um, there will be new um, uh, new uh, 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 national economy strategies, which are inevitably will be more. Um, self, self re relying, which of course has good and bad, uh, bad, bad, bad parts uh, uh, of it. And um, you know, uh, you mentioned China, and uh, and I don't want to be too uh, sound. Uh, I don't know Malthusian here, but um, uh, the most the the paradox is that the most dynamically in the recent years, decades, the most dynamically uh, developing part of the world economy operated in the least sustainable way. They right. were the most polluting, the most, and, and it, it's not only the Chinese, you know, these, these uh, supply chain didn't go them by you know, by itself, you know. It was uh, you know, and this is uh, my my good old friend Waller saying, you know, it was the greed of the of 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 uh, for profit which uh, moved right. uh, everything. But nevertheless, uh, now uh, and this crisis brought this out very clearly. Uh, the sub all the supply chain is not just high tech. Simple things, you know, a, a face mask, you know, what's the big deal about uh, producing a face mask? Everything, the end of the supply chain is in China. All the, the real part of the, the, the economic machinery somehow 
uh, move to China or even uh, or, or even further. And uh, my question to you as an economist that that, uh, you know, uh, I believe it's not sustainable. It needs to be changed. Uh, self-reliance of in, in uh, some new um, uh, national economic strategies can be good. Finally, fulfill the millennium development goals that our consumption should be production and consumption as local as possible. A can of yogurt doesn't have to travel 1500 kilometers or, or, a, or, a, or a piece of meat or egg or whatever. Uh, uh, so most of them could be could be pro produced uh, 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 locally, but what you implied is also you know sounded to me a little bit like you know this is really the end of the last safe fair the way we we know and the end of the uh, the the general agreement on 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 on, on tariff and the world trade organization these are all. Uh, organization created on the old old paradigm. One, and a lot of people argue for this, that it, it, finally we have to push everybody to take into the price calculation, the ecosystem services, what they use, the externalities, what they cause to third parties, they're from Herman Daly to uh, Epstein sure. to uh, there's a whole uh, whole uh, uh, going back to uh, uh, Schumacher. Uh, there's a whole uh, uh, it, it worked out. Of course, it probably needs to be revised, but somehow that uh, the the price is the only uh, driving force as cheap as possible. This is good for the consumer. This is the, the you know, argument of every government that we want cheap products uh, for, our, for our people. I think this, this has to be revised and, and ergo, as a consequence, a lot of our, our word organizations, which are based on the old, old paradigms, has to be totally revised. They just not WHO and and all they 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 I think you know without uh, citing Trump a lot of them are are, are failing and and uh, uh, the cost of uh, of ecosystem services the cost of normal uh, normal labor cost the cost of uh, transport they all has to be taken into consideration and immediately we'll have a, a, a you know a, an achievement of of what you said, a new new strategy to to produce as much, and of course the I know the bad part and autarkic, you know, uh, Belarusian model that or North Korean model that we can do everything, but somehow this this uh, this is this hyper uh, price cheap price cheap labor oriented uh, idea where we totally disregard where it comes from and there what it costs to to third party to uh, externalities and 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 the ecosystem it doesn't matter the important thing that i get it cheap uh, on my on, on on in my in my shopping basket right uh, i think that I, I agree with you, and, and I, I think uh, it will have to change a couple of things. One is that under the current model, the measure of everything, everything, ultimately translates to a calculation of the return on capital. So they will want to do cheaper products, reduce costs and uh, prices, if it results in a greater return on capital. They will not do it if it does not result in a greater return on capital. Okay. Then the, 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 the question therefore becomes one of the regulation, supervision, the role, if you like, of capital. Because that's where the problem starts from. It's the maximization of the return on capital that is driving all these other issues. Uh, the second, the second point I would like to make is that this current system 
globalization and the whole idea of global production and supply chains is the ultimate colonialization model of capital. Uh, and, and, and as such, it has created and continues to fuel very serious political and social problems. Um, the third one is that the point about national self-efficiency, I think, <clears throat> is, is, is coming, but it has its limitations because there is a problem of scale. Um, a country like Belarus or, uh, or Hungary or North Korea cannot be self-sufficient because it's too small. Um, that therefore erases the question of what will happen with small countries in this emerging new world. Well, some small countries have already crossed that bridge and have made their decision and feel very good about being in the European Union. Uh, the Baltic states have absolutely no problems with the European Union. The Benelux countries have no problems with being in the European Union. Uh, some others, like Hungary and Poland, uh, do have a problem with being in the European Union. So smaller countries will have to make up their minds on what kind of groupings they would like to belong to, be a member of, because the scale is what is driving this issue. If, the, if you don't have the right scale, you cannot be self-sufficient. If you cannot be self-sufficient, but you don't belong to a group, you're going to be horribly exposed to all kinds of very nasty uh, consequences that you are not going to be able to handle. So the, the, the kind of nationalism that Orban uh, is is exhibiting is dead wrong and not for the reason that the liberals cite that is the checks and balances and rule of law and all of those sort of things but because as an as an economic matter it doesn't work uh, hungary has nowhere to go outside the eu it cannot degenerate the degree of self-sufficiency with which it could safely exit some larger grouping. Now, whether you can talk about, you know, a smaller grouping than the EU, say the Visegrad Four or some other, you know, thing uh, uh, in lieu of the EU to which Hungary would want to belong, uh, that's another question. And, uh, you know, that's worth examining and debating. Maybe there are other configurations that one can talk about. Maybe the Mediterranean countries can represent a configuration of their own and, and, and get away from Northern Europe with which it has not been possible to develop the kind of modus vivendi that would keep them together. So, so you know, so possibly the European Union will break up, but the breakup of the European Union does not answer the scale problem. Thank you, and well, thank um, you. I think our, our time is up. And uh, on this note, I would like to uh, thank uh, Professor Rona sharing our uh, his thoughts. And uh, we hope this is not the uh, uh, the last time. And when we get uh, feedback from our viewers, then um, you will get all, all of them. And hope we meet in person soon too. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.